your hand is what I need Right next to me standing on my own feet I see how the time has changed the way That we move forward Remember when I was chasing the time You're always there to hold me So I find some
Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome at this farewell session for Luke. Uh, first of all, of course, welcome to Luke. Very great that you're here. Welcome Nelly, your wife, and all four children with partners. Welcome here in Tilburg University. We are going to say goodbye to you, unfortunately. Maybe fortunately for you. I'm deeply honored uh, to be here because um, when I started working here in Tilburg 14 years ago, since that time, I've been closely collaborating with you on a lot of different projects, mostly involving the European Value Study, uh, two atlases, um, also uh, projects on education, now the Evalue project, for example, the Respectman book, uh, and a lot of other publications and book chapters. So I'm very honored that I can be sort of the host of this session. And I know, Luke, that you are also a bit insecure about this session, that you think, hmm, is this really necessary? Yes, it is. <laughs> it is necessary. And to make you a little bit feel at home, I see I have the wrong slide. Could you please give the other slide? I put on the wrong slide. This slide, this slide is that we need. And to make you feel a little bit more at home, we will do like this. And if you go see in the back, there are people sitting there. That was the reason why we are dressed like this. I hope you feel more comfortable now. Yes, a bit more informal. Okay, then we will start. And I will first give the floor to our dean, the dean of uh, our school, Antoinette Bond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for these beautiful studies, the European Value Studies. I've, since I started as dean, I heard a lot about your great study and how relevant it is at this moment that we discuss values in Europe. And it's so relevant. And now, last night, it became so concrete where I saw your atlas. I was looking at the beautiful pictures, all the relevant data, and also in the context of where we are at our, in our European, yeah, where we are. So, um, but it is very, I would like very much, uh, would you please stand up? Because I think it's relevant that El we give you a warm applause at this start of this meeting. I hope you feel the warmth of this audience and, and all the work you did. And that is a nice summary of your work. And I'm really proud on your work. You can sit. So I can give the word to the next speaker. And the next speaker is Ruud Luijks, chair of the executive committee of the European in Values study and also a dear colleague of you. Dear Luke, Nelly and children, so this session is dedicated uh, to Luke, it's a kind of farewell, a goodbye to one of the EVS core members. Um, well, this also brings me a bit to my own history. Um, I entered university 46 years ago and Luke short, shortly after that. And so we know each other about 40 years now, so time is running. Um, the years after the studies, we connected a bit through work, with Muffles. Um, and of course, I realized you were a master assistant to Ruth de Moor and involved in a very interesting project, the European Value Study. When trying to reconstruct your personal history, and that was not that easy, I couldn't find an extended CV on the web or wherever, um, I didn't get all the facts precisely, but it must have been around 1984, 1985, that you got involved and started also to publish on the European values. The first publication was with Rutte Moore, Felix Heungs and Harry Sanders in 1987. Your dissertation defense was in 1991, and your supervisors were again Ruth de Moor and Jacques Hagenaas, who is sitting over there. And it was on values in the Western world, an international exploration 
of values in Western society. That's the English translation of, of the Dutch. About similarities and differences of relevant values based on the first wave of EVS and focusing on the transition from tradition to modernity. And one of the innovative things then was that you were using latent class analysis that also found its way in an article in the European Sociological Review. In the meanwhile, if I reconstructed it rightly, you became the secretary of what was then called the steering committee of EVS and a position that you actually would keep until 2013. The second wave of EVS was in 1990 because the first wave was not realized in 1980, but in 1981, this meant that we would live with a nine year interval from then. And so the decision was taken to do it that way. And one of the main reasons, if I remember rightly, or if I heard it rightly, was that some of the AIDS period cohort specialists in the team really insisted that it would be nine years from then on. Together with co-authors, you published after the second wave on value chains in Europe and Northern America, and numerous publications were written, many covering religion in a secularizing society and individualization. As the secretary of the steering committee, the later executive committee, you traveled all over Europe. I remember you did that a lot in the 1990s to visit the different countries and to prepare for the next wave. And I think it was an important thing to do so then because European values were still growing and it was important to create good connections with the people in, in the field in the different countries. Well, the consequence at least was that 33 counties were um, surveyed in, the, in that wave. Um, a lot of scientific output, um, also in books and uh, published in the EVS series that was uh, uh, published by Brill. Um, and actually I counted it and of the 18 books that were published by Brill, uh, 13 were co-edited uh, by you. And maybe one of the most important things you did then, um, next to, of course, making the European Value Study possible, and well, the most important thing, of course, is to have data, because if you don't have data, you cannot make publications, um, is that you actually decided or took the initiative to uh, publish an Atlas of European Values, and that was uh, presented, and I was one of the co-authors of the first one, uh, was presented to uh, the then Prime Minister, uh, Jan Peter Balken, and uh, in the presence of ambassadors of the European Union. Uh, remembering the UK ambassador being there with two bodyguards, uh, so that was uh, quite, <laughs> quite some uh, spectacle. Um, that was the first atlas of, of three, right? And the second one was published in 2011, and Inge already uh, referred to that. And yesterday we presented the last one in Brussels to Robert de Groot, uh, the Dutch ambassador to the European Union, who promised to distribute it to all his 26 colleagues, uh, because we have 27 members nowadays. Um, I think these atlases are a very important way to put the work of the European Value Study uh, under the attention uh, not only of diplomats and policy makers, but also of a broader public. I mean, uh, the, the way that the last uh, atlas is now uh, received by people and all the very positive things we hear about it really shows that by making this kind of uh, publications, uh, well, social science data uh, also get find a way in the, the broader public. And I hope that the last atlas will get a lot of publication in, in the coming months, uh, also in the national and international press. Another initiative that you actually did um, was to kind of publish uh, what we would call source books, or maybe call it now books of numbers. Um, I remember the third wave, you, you made the first uh, uh, table book with all the tables, all the variables. Um, well, it can be a bit dull, but uh, on the other hand, that's also of great value to policymakers and, and journalists because, well, they can easily see what the distributions are. 
um, and also what the change over time is. And uh, some of these books were published uh, together with the World Values uh, Survey. Um, as mentioned already, you were the, uh, for many years the secretary of the executive committee. Uh, lastly, with uh, Paul de Graaf uh, as chair, who is also here. Uh, and in preparation of the fourth wave, uh, uh, the two of you were very active in fundraising for the fourth wave. And that led actually to a great success, maybe the greatest success until now, if it comes to coverage of, of Europe. Uh, because in 2008, and, well, the wave, the fourth wave was actually fielded in 47 countries, regions. Um, then in 2013, uh, when prepare, uh, preparing the last wave, um, you became the uh, chair of the executive committee. Uh, David Foss uh, became the chair of the theory group and uh, myself the chair of the methodology group. And during all these times there were many meetings, uh, often in Tilburg, Leuven and, and Cologne, but also in Milan, Vienna, Bilbao, Warsaw, Athens, Ljubljana and Tbilisi. Over the years, Luke sometimes a bit adversely worked together with the World Value Survey, but in preparation to the last wave with great success, forcing a memorandum of understanding on the cooperation between European Value Study and the World Value Survey, with the EVS taking the lead in Europe. And that, to a certain extent, was important to make that last wave again into a great success. Often I and quite a few people here had the opportunity to, to travel with Luke and that was fun or almost always fun. Um, if you have to describe Luke's personality and I should be careful here, um, there is some introversion and determination or should I say stubbornness but when traveling and certainly by plane, some kind of transformation happened 10 kilometers in the sky. You saw his activity level actually increasing. And just before landing, he would put in his earplugs, troubled by the change in air pressure. And by touching the tarmac, Mr. EVS was born again. He then would run ahead, eager to explore the visiting country and ready to see his friends and colleagues from the European Value Study. On the other hand, introversion would pop up again in the early morning when he tried to have a very early breakfast, not to be confronted with EVS questions and issues too early in the morning. In 2020, Luke all of a sudden decided to step down from the executive committee and the board of the EVS Foundation. Apparently a kind of preparation for his retirement from Tilburg University that started in September last year. I guess he decided it was time for the younger generation to take over, an invitation that I happily accepted. <laughs> Luke, EVS is proud to have you had as an active member in all kinds of positions. We will miss you in the organization, but you will be the one and only Mr. EVS. Enjoy your holiday, you postponed for this meeting, and try to enjoy your retirement. Okay, thank you, Ruth, for this nice speech. No, we have more. <laughs> now we have a really nice talk by David Foes from University College London, um, who gives a keynote because we're at a conference, so there will be a keynote. David, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's a tremendous honor to be here on this day in particular, when we honor Luke, who's been such a great friend and colleague. And on this particular occasion, even better dressed than I am. So I, I thought that I had worked out that there was a certain Dutch cultural tradition that you didn't wear a tie, and Luke continues to confound our expectations by appearing uh, so splendidly. 
I'm, I'm going to be presenting a paper that in many ways is a sort of Holman-esque survey of core issues related to values in Europe and ones that are related indeed to the very foundation of the European values study. The question that I'd like to address is where do beliefs and values come from? And I think in doing so, I'm following in the tradition that uh, Luke has established since his first work on this topic in uh, 1987, indeed, where the study of religious change, amongst other things, uh, was pursued not just for its own sake, and of course it is uh, a very interesting and important topic, but for what it tells us about value change in general. So that's the general strategy here. Even if you aren't particularly interested in religion, think about the topics that you are interested in and how uh, the kinds of considerations that I'll be mentioning relate to those topics. So in particular, um, it's very clear that our beliefs and values are closely related to those in the society around us. We come to assimilate what we learn at school, uh, from our peers, from what we hear through media and other channels. Uh, but of course, we have also had things transmitted to us by our families, in particular parents and grandparents. So what's the balance between those two? Uh, how much of what we believe and value uh, is inherited uh, in a social but fairly direct way from family, how much of it is passed down uh, socially through our ordinary contacts. Well, it's clear that these two factors account for a huge amount of the variance we observe in uh, beliefs and values, particularly in the sphere of, of religion. Uh, there is a certain amount of individual variation that can be explained via gender and education and uh, other factors, and those things can be important. But much of that individual variation uh, is just hard, ultimately, to reduce to things we can identify. It just seems a bit idiosyncratic. But the effects of family and uh, society uh, is clearly extremely important. Well, what is it about family that's so crucial. Parents have a large amount of influence, not to say control, uh, over their children. There's overt teaching that goes on. Uh, there's direct control over activities, what one does in the way of, for example, going to church or praying uh, in creating the habits that are so important and underpinning uh, later life religiosity. And of course, there's the semi-conscious modeling that parents do uh, by behaving in certain ways or saying certain things. But of course, there are also indirect effects, and here's where you have a sort of crossover between family and social influences. So the aspects of social influence that are so important, things like where you live, who you hang out with, what schools you go to, uh, what kinds of media you consume, all of those things are to varying degrees initially controlled by and perhaps later influenced by your parents until such time as they have no influence whatsoever and you actually rebel and do completely different things. Uh, but during much of the formative period in childhood and early adolescence, uh, parents have an influence over those social factors as well. Well, in some work that, of mine that was published last year, uh, we looked at parents and the national context and tried to see testing a uh, hypothesis that actually has been around in the published literature for a long time uh, to see whether there was an interaction be between them in religious socialization. And interestingly, our conclusion was that these things operate fairly independently, that both are very important, uh, but the parental influence doesn't depend 
on the, the religiosity of the national context. And that's contrary to some findings uh, that may be known to some of you, uh, published by uh, Kelly and de Graaf, uh, oh, some 30 odd years ago. So just to give you uh, a sort of uh, indication, uh, parental religious involvement is along the horizontal axis, from secular on the left to very actively religious on the right. And we have four groups of countries from the most secular uh, in yellow through to the most religious in blue at the top. And you can see that um, parents, if they are actively religious, transmit that religiosity, uh, whatever sort of country uh, you're in. So these are all diagonal lines where the parental influence is very strong. It matters a lot whether your parents are relatively secular or very actively religious. It also matters a lot what kind of country you're in. The more secular uh, countries uh, end up with uh, more secular children in them. Conversely, the uh, most highly religious uh, uh, countries have uh, effects on uh, the people who grow up there. So uh, there are big gaps between these lines, but the lines are roughly parallel. So there's not much sign of interaction between the parental influences and the national influences. And I think that's a very interesting finding. Uh, that particular graph came from the ISSP, uh, but I am going to be using the EVS and what follows uh, very appropriately. Well, uh, there are a couple of hypotheses here. Um, and again, I'm talking specifically about religion, but uh, this might apply uh, to other sorts of uh, beliefs and values. So one hypothesis is that parents work harder to instill their particular values in contexts that are not very conducive uh, or hospitable to those values. Uh, the second hypothesis, the alternative if you like, is that religious parents, for example, feel actually less inclination uh, to work hard in more secular contexts and that conversely they're encouraged in religious societies to try to pass on their own religiosity. Well, we did some indirect tests and found that, as I say, the two factors were largely independent, but we can do a direct test using the EVS uh, and in particular that question about what's important in the upbringing of children. So the question is, please say for each of the following. Uh, well, so this is the background on the respondents. Uh, we can gauge the importance of religion uh, amongst other things in life, and people will say whether it's very important, not so important, and so on. Uh, but then they're also asked about qualities that a child can learn at home, and they pick five out of 11, at least in 2008. So one of those uh, was religious faith, and the question is, what proportion of people say that religious faith is one of those qualities that it's important for children to learn at home? Well, the first thing to note is that the proportion of people who say that religion is important to them in life varies considerably across the European continent, uh, from a low of about 10% in Northern Europe uh, to a high of some 37% in southern Europe. So that's the percentage saying religion is very important in their lives. But whatever the region is and whatever the level of importance, only about half of those people are identifying religious faith as a key quality for children to acquire. So here's a bar chart with uh, northern Europe on the right, southern Europe on the left, the height of the bar in total represents the percentage of the population that sees religion as very important. So that's the 37% versus 10% that I mentioned just now. But you can see that the uh, fraction of each bar that's orange, and that's showing that uh, religion is a key quality uh, for children to acquire at home, is about half. Uh, in all those regions. So it doesn't matter whether you're 
uh, in a highly religious region or part of Europe or a less religious part of Europe, uh, even amongst people who say they're very religious, only about half of those are choosing religious faith as something that is crucial for children to acquire. Okay, so again, it doesn't seem to be the case that in more secular countries, parents are more committed to transmission of religiosity. And here's another way of uh, looking at the same message. Again, uh, different lines for different regions. Uh, parental uh, religiosity along the horizontal axis at the bottom, from not at all important on the left to very important on the right. And you can see that the lines are more or less parallel. Uh, the more religious uh, regions have uh, higher levels um, giving that answer, uh, secular regions less so, uh, but there's no particular sign that in secular countries, more religious parents are trying harder. Okay, so in fact, it seems, uh, and maybe this is not a great surprise, but it does contradict something that uh, has been talked about a lot in recent decades, uh, that it's in fact more religious contexts that encourage the transmission of religiosity, um, including the importance of uh, bringing children up in the faith. Well, just as an aside, the relationship between belief and practice changes with secularization. So uh, frequent attenders have similar levels of attendance, uh, sorry, frequent attenders have similar levels of belief, uh, whatever kind of society they're in, whereas non-attenders vary considerably. So again, let's look at the pictures. Um, here we have, oops, uh, come back, um, attendance at the bottom, so this is very frequent attendance on the right, uh, never attending on the left. And again, you have different colored lines for different quartiles of national uh, religiosity, the most religious countries being purple, least religious being blue. And over at the high attendance level, you can see pretty much all of those high attenders, whatever country you're in, have very high levels of religious belief. That seems to make sense. Um, but what's interesting is that over on this left-hand side, where we're looking at people who don't participate very much in church going, there's quite a lot of difference now between the more and the less religious countries. In the more religious countries, people are still pretty believing, even if they're not participating, even if they're not going to church, they still say that they believe in God and so on. Whereas here, uh, over on the left, for the more secular countries, the people who are not going to church have really sunk to relatively low levels of religious belief. So the, to be technical about it, the bivariate distribution of belief and attendance varies according to the degree of secularization of the society. And that's something that actually you find not only between countries, but even within countries. So here, using the general social survey in the United States, we see different generations from the oldest, most religious generation at the top to the youngest, least religious generation at the bottom. And again, we see the same phenomenon. The uh, highly faithful churchgoers are also highly faithful believers in, across the board uh, in all these generations, but those who never attend or very rarely attend are considerably different depending on the cohort that they happen to belong to just within one country. Well, how does that come about? maybe attendance is some kind of leading indicator of religious decline. And that's something that I'm gonna come back to in just a moment. We know, I think, after a couple of decades of work on this topic, uh, that religious decline is generational. That's to say most religious change is occurring between generations, not within 
a given generation. It's not a matter of people deciding in adult life that they no longer believe or they don't want to go to church. That, of course, does happen. People become more or less religious in adult life. But within any given generation, those individual level changes seem to balance out. Uh, religious change is mostly a matter of generational replacement in the population where the more religious older people are replaced in the population as they die out by less religious younger adults coming up behind. But note that generation has two meanings and it's potentially ambiguous but in an interesting way. One is the position in a family lineage grandparent, parent, child. That's, if you like, the sort of biblical generation of so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. But it also refers to the group that comes of age at a particular time in certain social conditions. So this is the Karl Mannheim notion of generation. And those two senses actually relate directly to parental influence on the one hand, the family generation, uh, and the social context on the other. That's the, uh, the idea of a generation uh, in terms of temporal location. So you have, on the one hand, variations in household transmission that can bring about similarities or differences between different generations within the same family, but then you also have variations in the environment of upbringing that can produce the generation gaps that commentators love to talk about, the differences between uh, the silent generation and baby boomers and generation X and Y and Z and the millennials and so on, uh, whatever terms that uh, might be applied. Well, which is most important when it comes to religious decline or indeed value change of other sorts? I think this is actually an interesting and perhaps understudied question. So does religious decline, for example, happen because of incomplete transmission of religious identity, practice, belief, and values within a family? Or does religious decline occur because of social and economic and cultural change that's then producing change in each successive cohort? And in that case, family religiosity could be just a, an explanatory variable, a bit like gender or education or ethnicity that helps to explain differences within particular families uh, but it's not helping us very much to explain the process of change. Now, it could be more complicated than that. Maybe social change is being um, executed, if you like, at the family level, and so family uh, level change is the vehicle for uh, these social generational changes. Uh, but I think this is something that needs some attention. Well, one of the big issues currently, I think, in the study of religious change is how in practice and via what mechanisms religious involvement diminishes. So what's going on with behavioral and cognitive and emotional commitments? I mean, are people, for example, uh, drifting away from church and then they eventually stop believing or is their belief weakening, and so then their practice follows suit. Um, that's something that we're trying to work out. Um, it would be reasonable, I think, to suppose that because church attendance requires work, that's something uh, that's easy to give up. It takes time and effort. Um, you would perhaps stop that before you stop believing. But I think it's actually more complicated and perhaps right back in the early days of change, uh, we should look at cracks in the religious worldview and what's taken for granted uh, in beliefs and values. So there's 
an introduction of doubt, but also I'm going to suggest maybe a change in the nature of the beliefs. There's something about the kind of God that you believe in, the degree of conviction with which you believe, and the importance that you attach to that belief, all of which cumulatively uh, then leads to um, what follows. Well, we could also ask what kinds of beliefs are uh, going to go earlier or later, and I've listed them not necessarily on the basis of any great research, uh, but just in some kind of plausible order um, to suggest which ones might be most vulnerable and which ones would be with us for the longest. Mm. In contemporary society, I think we are perhaps most resistant to uh, the demands of authority, including religious authority, and indeed in a presentation earlier today, uh, the importance of personal freedom and the continued significant increases in the priority attached to freedom as a personal value uh, was underlined. But then, uh, working down through the, the list at the bottom, the idea that some things are meant to be is and continues to be commonplace in society. It's perhaps the, the most popular uh, part of our worldviews that still has some sort of religious origin. So, uh, one thing that strikes me, and again, this is sort of overview of the field, um, partly for those of us who work in it and partly for the benefit of those of you who don't, is that we've tended to measure things that are easy to measure, and that's uh, a common issue in, in social science. Uh, but one thing that I think we haven't done or given enough importance to, uh, because it's not easy to, to measure, is just how much difference beliefs and values make to people. What's the importance of religion or more broadly spirituality in people's lives? Uh, how central is God in uh, your worldview, for example? And moreover, what sort of conception of God do you have? I refer here to the work of Paul Froese and Chris Bader, um, who wrote a book called America's Four Gods, which I recommend, and they describe four very different kinds of representations of God as being in common currency in contemporary American society. So this isn't even a matter of change over time. It's something that you can find in one place at one time where different people are all referring to belief in God, but they're all actually believing in different things. And the, the critical questions, it's a sort of uh, two-dimensional matrix, is how closely involved is God in the world and how judgmental is God or how angry is God about human sin? But in addition to that, as I mentioned, I think we need to consider the degree of conviction or doubt and the importance that these issues have in the first place. Well, um, my hypothesis would be that in some societies and at some times, God is seen as highly engaged in the world and indeed inclined to be punitive or at least uh, will be upset if things are not going uh, according to the commandments. Uh, but in late modern societies, this higher power or uh, divine force is more abstract, distant, unknowable, and not especially morally involved or even concerned. Uh, and it seems to me that secularization actually begins with the erosion of a sort of theocentric or God-centered worldview. And this change, I think, is happening mostly at societal level, and so only indirectly at family level. Well, uh, there's an ISSP question that 
is a kind of proxy for the importance of uh, religion, and that's agreement or disagreement with the statement, life is meaningful only because God exists. And what's interesting is when you look around the world at the levels of agreement with that, it's extraordinarily high in some countries, like Turkey, where you almost universally uh, assented to, and very low in other countries, in the most secular countries in Europe, for example. Uh, Self-described religiosity is another one that actually is not so different, but I think it discriminates slightly less well between the, the religious and secular countries. So what's happening to what Peter Berger referred to as the sacred canopy? Uh, what really erodes the foundations of that canopy is when people stop taking beliefs and values for granted. So doubt and awareness of alternatives chips away at the foundations, the plausibility structures collapse, God starts to seem more distant, and of course at the same time social complexity <clears throat> is a sort of precursor to uh, differentiation in society. And I think that the changes in the image of God are important in that process, and the impact is then felt on attendance, even though some kind of belief and claimed belief persists. Uh, but although belief is quite resilient, it does nevertheless decline. If we take just a few sample countries, we can see that uh, there's actually a good deal of consistency across these measures, life only being meaningful because God exists, knowing that God exists, so that's the s most uh, strongly held position about the existence of God, attending services at least monthly, and then believing in God uh, with uh, doubts as well as without doubts. And you can see that following across the rows for each of those countries, there are clearly levels from the uh, most religious places like the Philippines through to the least religious like Eastern Germany. Well, let me give you, just to wrap up, um, a couple of graphs on uh, the religiosity of the respondent by parental religious characteristics and the country type. So I'm circling back to this issue of the relative influence of family and society in transmitting religiosity. So over on the left-hand uh, graph, uh, we have agreement that life is meaningful only because God exists, and then on the right, there's uh, praise at least sometimes. So you have the most religious countries uh, in blue, that's at the top, and the least religious, the most secular countries in yellow at the bottom. So again, you can see that uh, it makes a big difference whether you are living in a very religious or a very secular society. That's the gap between the blue line at the top and the yellow line at the bottom. But it also makes a considerable difference whether your parents were very secular over on the left or very religious over on the right. So the lines are angled upwards. If the lines were very steeply angled and overlapping, then that would suggest that it's parental religiosity that's the key influence. If the lines are more parallel and uh, somewhat flatter and widely spaced, that would suggest that it's national differences or societal differences uh, that are key to explaining that particular variable. So that's what I've just put up on that slide. Let's have a look at the graph again. And although it's um, not very, very sharp, I'm suggesting that here parental religiosity seems to have more influence. There's more overlap in these lines and they're somewhat steeper angled. Here, national religiosity seems more important. The gaps are larger and they're slightly flatter. So the prominence of God in everyday life seems to be largely determined by the culture 
that you live in. National influences there are particularly important, but the extent of religious activity, attendance, prayer, and so on, is something that's shaped within our families. So, thank you very much for your attention. As I say, that was a Holman-esque study in religious change and values and beliefs in a way that I hope shed some light on value change generally, uh, which has been the life work of our friend and colleague, Luke Harmon. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, David, for this very interesting keynote, which I'm sure brings up a lot of thoughts, questions, but I suggest that we leave it uh, for the for the drinks, all the theoretical, methodological discussions, but maybe also discussions about hmm, what kind of values does Luke transmit to his children? We never know. <laughs> we can ask later. I would like now to invite uh, our rector Magnificus, Wim van der Donk, who has also joined us here today, uh, to come to the stage to uh, say some words for you, Luke, and to bring a very special gift. Yes, Luke and your friends from the European Values. Uh, it's an honor for me actually to pop up again in the scenery of this conference that started yesterday in Brussels, in the heart of Europe, I would say. And it was such a nice event and promising in the sense that your work, Luke, uh, Mr. FAS, uh, come back on it in a minute, is uh, so acknowledged as being more and more important in the heart of that European policymaking community we visited yesterday. Actually, the permanent representative of the Netherlands uh, to the European Union, Robert de Groot, uh, after that he was presented the Atlas himself, um, he immediately promised that he would order at least 27 copies to distribute them among his colleagues, ambassadors, to the EU, who now are constantly 24-7 uh, committed and uh, gathering uh, in Brussels in order to discuss the attitude and all the practical measures that politically have been decided upon towards the Ukraine. And uh, you know how intensively he was there yesterday, uh, committed not only to that work that he has to be uh, that he has to do in Brussels, but also having some time to come to our conference and to really reflect. I was surprised by the way he was well aware of the significance and, and the, the value of, of this research for his work, and that was a good sign. It was also, look, I think a sign of appreciation to you personally, because that's why I pop up again. Yesterday at the honor, they want me to give the atlas to Robert. I said, no, no, no. It will be done by the researchers, it's not my work, but I'm very proud, as Rector Mieficus of this university, that one of these, um, well, major, long-term, enduring research uh, projects that we have in this university is at European Value Studies. That was uh, one of my predecessors, Rutte Moore and Jan Kerikhofs, but I had, like Luke, the honor to know them both very well. Um, they started it, and um, I know, Luke, that you, uh, have worked closely together with them, but that you always talked with great warmth and love about those, those two inspirators from the beginning of this research project. But, um, and there I am again and again, I'm asked to give a book. Not an atlas on values, but reflections on European values. And look, I'm impressed uh, by, I can show you, it's, it's, it's a huge volume in which all the friends and the researchers and the contributors to European value studies these last decade have contributed a really, really interesting and large uh, amount of, I think, 32 chapters or something like that, that indeed is one of these products that is already you know, popping up from the last stage and the last wave of empirical data uh, gathering. Um, and it is uh, an honor to you, actually, this book, I would say. And it's meant as an honor to you, and it's rightfully so. Um, and we learned a lot about Luke 
um, in the different chapters too, because it's not only scientific rigor, it's good research and new ideas and reflections on all the, the topics. One of your slides, a colleague, uh, was it's probably more complicated. Well, that is the main message away of many of these research. Uh, at first glance, the data are gathered and we are uh, confronting them with theory and it's inspiring to further hypothesis of all kinds of subjects that the European value studies are. But it's also about you. It's about Luke who always, you know, with humor, especially in airplanes, I've learned, um, uh, contributed not only to the scientific rigor of the project, I remember very well our personal discussions about the relation of European value study with world value studies, with Roald Engelhardt and Robert Putnam and so I remember very well that Luke, and you did it again yesterday, was always about precision and not just talking about values, but being precise and being rigorous in what kind of data are really of the quality that we could put in the book and, 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 and use for the research. And not only just small talk and, and quick wins, but really scientific rigor. That was the contribution, one of the contributions Luke um, uh, gave to, to this project with his heart and soul uh, being um, responsible for the quality of the research that was presented. And quality of research, you all know, that started with the quality of the data, which is, especially as values are concerned, quite a thing. Measuring values is completely different than measuring other dimensions of social and political and economic life. It's even more complicated, it's probably more complicated. But still, you did a wonderful job all these decades uh, to, uh, to serve this project and to serve the long-term goals that are coming with it. And it is an honor for me, look to on behalf, and this time I accepted the honor to give the book to you, um, uh, contributing myself also a little bit of our common history in the, in, in the project uh, and uh, to which I have also very, very sweet and very warm memories of the kind of attitude that you always were helping people and inviting them to be part of this project. It was uh, an honor to work with you and I think that honoring you with furthermore and even more reflections on European values is just the way we should and could honor you by now leaving the university, leaving the project, but we will never forget and we count a little bit on your enduring commitment in one way or another on the project. But I know that retirement is another stage that you enjoy with your family, uh, your wife and the, and the family. And of course we are, you know, more than obliged to give you that opportunity. But really we cannot miss you in uh, some other dimensions of this project and I hope that this book is not only an honoring, uh, it's honoring you for all the work that you have been done as a, as a warm colleague, uh, everybody was, uh, you never said no if you asked for help, look you were a great researcher uh, and caring for your colleagues but also um, you know an inspiring colleague that you know never was um, leaving us aside when we had these uh, these questions about quality of data and, and inspiring research. And this is in this book. It's a great volume for a great man with great service to our university. Thank you so much and may I now invite you to indeed actually have the first copy of this book for you. Only, only one question, and I'm not the uh, one that can answer that. If you show the book, and especially the front of the book, the editors are confronted with just one question. Why, and I especially link to the dean of the School of Behavioral Sciences, why there is a bridge in Rotterdam on the cover? Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Tim uh, would like to uh, answer that question because Tim also wants to say some words and then Luke, you can have uh, the microphone. Yes, you can sit down. Yeah, so maybe thank you, uh, first of all, uh, Luke, uh, for, for all your inspiring years. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm now the National Programme Director for the Netherlands. Uh, I, I stepped in your, in your footsteps. Um, but uh, also throughout uh, your courses, uh, throughout the conversations that we had, 
Um, sometimes we, we had these, uh, these teachings for the honor, honor students, uh, where you also shared your inspiring uh, experiences, your ins experiences with uh, national leaders. Uh, and I try to convey like this enthusiasm for the European Value Study also to future students at our, our school. Uh, but indeed, uh, uh, it was actually uh, Ruth's idea to, uh, to uh, write this, uh, this, uh, this Libre Amicorum, uh, this Book of Friends. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we wrote to several national program directors, several colleagues at, uh, at school, uh, several compagnons de route, uh, uh, so uh, um, people like uh, yeah, some, some other people that, that also uh, retired over the past few years, like Will Arts. Um, to write a chapter in this book and uh, to be honest, with great enthusiasm, they responded yes. As you can see, uh, uh, actually it was also a surprise for the publisher that uh, this big volume, uh, 30, 32 chapters, were offered to, to him. Uh, uh, maybe it's also uh, your leg legacy, because in the end uh, you, you were uh, doing a lot of research on sociology of religion, and uh, this way we also wanted to mimic a little bit the Bible. Um, we, we tried to come close. It's not completely, uh, completely yeah, uh, the whole Bible, uh, Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, let's hope that also with uh, the Center of Excellence, we also can continue with the legacy uh, of, of you, build a New Testament of European values research in the future as well. So uh, uh, for those who, uh, uh, a lot of colleagues are here that co-authored uh, or that authored the paper for this, uh, this Libre Amicorum, uh, so these colleagues, they will receive a copy. Uh, for those that did not author, uh, sorry, did not author uh, a chapter, you can always go to the website evseries.eu uh, to order your uh, own copy. Um, it's open access eh, because that's what you can see as well. It's actually the second edition of the European Value Series. And so uh, the first, the first edition of this, uh, or the first edition in the series, was uh, presented by you. Uh, yesterday, it's the Atlas. The second edition in the series is actually the Sleeper Amicorum, and we have three days of conference, so who knows actually what tomorrow will bring. <laughs> Don't worry, uh, there won't be a third edition in the series yet, but as you know, uh, we do have some, uh, some projects in the pipeline, including this, uh, this book on polarization that we actually started already before the pandemic, but that we should finish also in due time, wherever whenever that actually may be. So maybe to talk a little bit about, about the content of the, the Libre, eh? you're, you're now browsing through the, the chapters and uh, through the, the, the table of contents. But we also wanted to, uh, um, yeah, to, to, um, to honor you, uh, and, and I think that the chapters that have been written and the content of this book also reflects your, your interest and your, your inspiration for values research. And so um, we wrote an introduction where uh, indeed uh, Ruud, Inge and uh, we, we uh, reflect on your years, uh, your contributions to the European Values uh, Study. Um, and we, we give an overview of all the chapters. And uh, I should not forget actually about the preface that was written by, uh, by Rector Magnificus uh, Wim van der Donk, because he asked us indeed about what's actually, what's introduction? Can, can you actually uh, show us the introduction? And indeed, as you can see, as you can read in the preface, uh, the, uh, the preface is indeed a, a very excellent uh, interaction with the introduction that we wrote. Uh, we follow with some theoretical and also methodological um, yeah, reflections on, on, on doing values research. People like Pierre Brechon, uh, Will Arts, uh, they, they wrote some theoretical exposés, some theoretical explorations uh, about okay, the values research in the past, but also the future. We have also uh, Jean Gilles, uh, his uh, chapter, where we also well, really remind us about, okay, what if we aggregate these national, these, these measures, these values at the aggregate level, well, how accurate actually are they? We then continue with some co comparative studies uh, on, on values research, of course, because indeed, uh, the European value study, well, uh, one of the uh, theoretical inspiration was modernization theory, which involves often cross-national research. So several chapters that have been written, and I really want to uh, apologize if I forget some of the colleagues who are here who have contributed to the chapter. I see, for instance, Ruth Muffels, uh, who wrote a chapter about uh, values and subjective well-being. I see also uh, Guy Moors, uh, who uh, also uh, replicated his uh, study in the 1990s with the 2017 data. Um, the uh, Hungarian and the Romanian team, uh, they, uh, they, uh, the, the presentation that they gave today about, I should be careful now, 
Hungarians in Transylvania, how religious uh, they are. Um, so there are a lot of cross-national studies actually in this uh, in this section of the of the book. Then we um, we first actually have uh, sociology of religion. I think I forgot about that. Yeah, that's what happens when you're actually trying to speak without papers. Anyway, the sociology of religion is a, a big chunk of uh, of the book as well. And uh, well, yeah, David gave a, a very extensive presentation today about uh, parental socialization of religiosity, and some uh, insights from uh, his, uh, his his presentation today are also actually part of uh, of the book. Uh, also, Kun Abs, uh, among others, uh, also wrote about uh, trust in in, in uh, trust in the church, and how uh, the whole controversy about uh, the pedophilia case in Belgium actually uh, led to a drop in uh, trust in the church. We also have uh, Inge and uh, Katja's contribution in this section about the sociology of religion. And then, indeed, after these comparative studies, we actually proceed with the uh, Netherlands. Uh, because uh, the Netherlands, as the national program director, original program director for the Netherlands, uh, you also had a, a big, um, yeah, a lot of, uh, of studies taking place on the Netherlands, including uh, the book that uh, was also mentioned, I think, by Ruud uh, Respectman. Uh, was uh, very much focused on the Netherlands, and we have some chapters uh, in this in this sec section on uh, the Netherlands, including one uh, chapter co-authored by Wim van Oorschot uh, and uh, at Erwin Gielens and uh, Kita Meis. Um, so it's very very well uh, exploration of values uh, also over time in the Netherlands, and then of course we close with some national case studies. Uh, um, some authors have uh, co-authored uh, chapters, for instance, uh, Suzanne uh, walman lundassen I don't know where she is, but she, for instance, focuses on the, uh, there you are, she focuses on, uh, of course, uh, yeah, the Nordic, the Nordic countries, uh, um, where she discusses Nordic ex exceptionalism. Um, there are some colleagues from Croatia, um, Greece, Macedonia, too much to discuss over here, um, but well, I think it's a lot of, uh, of uh, reading material for you for the next days, for the next weeks, or maybe the next months, depending on what you actually will do on your holiday. <laughs> I think it's uh, enough time talking now. I think we should actually give you the last word. Okay, does that work? Yes. Um, actually, I'm a little bit speechless now because I did not expect it, this at all. Um, many uh, famous people do not receive a Liber Amicorum, and I think I'm not so famous uh, at all, although you think I am, but I'm not, I think. Um, and at least I think that's something... Uh, so I'm, I'm really flattered uh, by, by this, and actually I don't know what to say apart from thank you very much for this, uh, really. Uh, it's also very thick, and there are indeed a lot of chapters uh, to be read. It's not that I finish this tomorrow. Uh, on the other hand, um, standing here in front of you makes me feel old, because I'm retired. And that is in, I'm entering a new stage in my life. Uh, the unknown is waiting uh, for me. Um, the, it is also a moment to reflect a little bit on my uh, academic life here at the university. Uh, and I wrote something uh, to tell you now today uh, for that reflection. Um, I spent my whole academic life here at the University of Tilburg. First as a student, a student assistant, and since 1984 as an employee. For my children, it is unbelievable that I have stayed at the same em uh, employer for such a long time, for all my life. And perhaps it is strange for most of you, uh, well, but I felt at home. 
and in my place, so why move? Last year, the building in which I spent almost my entire academic life was demolished. It was there. Um, I don't know if that is symbolic. <laughs> I started in the Department of Methodology and Statistics. Then I moved to uh, Nijmegen University, although posted in Tilburg. I worked at IVA, the research institute at our university. I uh, was appointed at WORK, the Work and Organization Research Center of our faculty, and later appointed in the Department of Sociology. And in all these positions, the European Value Study was the common thread. I'm only one of the few, if not the only one, uh, left from the early years of the project. I was not involved in the st when they started the whole project, but I entered the project in 1984. And now it is time to say goodbye and thank all the people uh, in the EVS project for the fine collaboration. And there are, of course, very many people still uh, in that project who uh, earn to be, uh, that I'm, I'm grateful to at the moment. I have to say that I did not count on an official farewell anymore. I have not been at university for more than uh, two years now, and contact was only via mail or in Zoom or Teams, team meetings. When I cleaned up and emptied my office at the university last summer, I did not run into anyone. It was completely empty. So I left my key and laptop at the desk of Els, our secretary, and thought, well, this is it. That is also what uh, Els mailed me. So, that, that's it then? That's it then? Well, apparently not. When I received the invitation for my farewell, I actually wanted to decline, especially because I don't like it at all being the center of attention, and I don't feel very comfortable in these kind of situations. I feared the worst, because also my family was invited, and you asked for a recent picture. <laughs> However, now that I'm here, um, I have to admit that my initial reason uh, was wrong, and I really am happy that I accepted your invitation in the end, because it marks the official end of my work at the university and in the European Value Study Project. And the presentation of the Atlas of European Values the latest version yesterday and the European Values Conference today and yet, uh, tomorrow are perfect occasions for that. However, you should know that the Atlas um, is much more the work of Inge, Tim and Marga than of me. I contributed only marginally to this uh, issue, to this version, and Marga in particular has been invaluable and indispensable for making this and the previous atlases uh, uh, available, making that uh, the previous atlases. I've greatly appreciated the collaboration on this atlas project, and I can only hope that it will be as successful as the previous ones. Inge, Tim, and Marga, 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 Marga is over there. Thank you for the fine uh, cooperation and all your work for the for realizing this new. Uh, Atlas. David, uh, thank you for your nice words and for your excellent keynote. I'm not going to comment on that now, that was not allowed by Inge. Um, but it was, as we are used from you, uh, a well thought and well argued presentation. And it reminded me of an EVS assembly meeting in Vienna a few years ago when you explained and defended the uh, work of the uh, EVS theory group. Um, what a brilliant performance was that. <laughs> it was clear and above all convincing to the participants in that uh, uh, assembly and everyone accepted uh, the changes that we made and the proposals that we, uh, that we had at that moment. So thank you for all your always valuable uh, contributions to the EVS uh, project. 
it is also thank to uh, I also thank you for saving us and especially me from errors in English. It is clear that I what, that what I am saying today has not been corrected by you. Speaking of the European Values Study, this project is now in good hands. Ruud Luijks has taken over uh, my position uh, and together with Vera Lomazzi, he has uh, taken the lead and he forms a good and reliable team, not only for organizing and coordinating the European Values Study, but also for securing the high quality of the project. It is good to know that they have taken the lead positions because it ensures the continuation of that unique and valuable uh, project. Ruth and I also uh, had a so-called theory and research course already a long time ago. But I still remember the sometimes hilarious meetings we had with students to discuss their papers. While I was trying to explain something seriously, Ruth was shaking his head as if I was speaking complete nonsense. Those were the good old days, uh, Ruth. <laughs> Thank you uh, for the many years of fine collaboration in good uh, spirit. The continuation of the European Values Project seems secured also because Tim has, has been very successful in starting a center of values research. Such a center has long been a dream for us. Tim realized our dream and established the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence of European Values. You see the banners here. Tim, thank you for making our dreams come true. Inge, due to you and in collaboration with Uwe Krause from Fontes University of Applied Sciences, who is, I don't know if he, uh, he's there as well, the data of our value survey find their way to pupils in secondary schools. Your project, European Values in Education, shows the usefulness and richness of the survey data from EVS for a wider audience. It is another dream of us that comes true and makes clear that the European Values project is indeed in good hands. Thank you, Inge, for all the many pleasant years we worked uh, together. The collaboration was not only in the European Values uh, Study, but also in teaching uh, activities. Uh, Tim, he took over my courses, uh, so some of my courses, and now is collaborating with uh, Arno Jan Weisselveld uh, in the Identity course and Paul Dekker in the course for Liberal Arts. I've greatly appreciated uh, the always pleasant uh, collaboration uh, with both of you, Paul and Arno Jan, uh, in these courses, and I really learned a lot uh, from you. I see also uh, at least Jacques Hagenaars and uh, Paul. Uh, I did not prepare for that. I did not expect so many people here, and uh, I did not expect you, uh, who are not anymore at the university. But I'm very grateful to uh, all the work you have done for me the, to be in my position and to uh, take the lead in the EVS uh, project. Uh, I'm very much uh, grateful uh, to you. I look back at interesting meetings in the faculties, library advisory committee, the ethical committee, and, the, and especially the examination uh, committee. We have seen some exciting cases and sometimes very amusing ones. Uh, but given the increasing number of rules and regulations from above and the increasing empowerment of students claiming their rights, I do not envy my successors in these uh, committees. <laughs> I wish them much wisdom and success. Peter, our chair of the department, thank you for all the freedom you gave me to do what I thought I had to do. You are leading the department in a jealous-making way. I've never seen you in a bad mood, and I hope that you can keep it up for years to come. Take good care of our department uh, members. All department members, and especially Els, the secretary of the department, I look back at the pleasant time at the university in the department. You were always fine uh, collaborative colleagues who make sociology the great science that it is. 
Not for nothing are you on the top floor of the Simon Building. As Peter, our chairman, once said, sociology is the queen of sciences and deserves the top floor of the building. So remember that. Uh, Wim, as long as I know you, uh, and that is before you became president of, uh, president of the WRR, the Dutch uh, Scientific Council for Government Policy, the Queen's or King's uh, commis Commissioner in the province of North Brabant and now Rector Magnificus and President of our University, you are and have always been strongly interested in values. I'm confident that you remain interested in values and that the University will host the Center of Values Research for a long time. The project deserves it and the University deserves the project. It is an honor for us that you made it possible uh, yesterday in uh, Brussels to present the Atlas there, and an honor for me that you introduced my farewell today. Thank you for, uh, for that. Uh, well, I stop now. Uh, sorry that I will not have mentioned everybody, uh, all of you who have contributed uh, to the interesting life and the good time that I had so far. I'm very, really very, very grateful to you, to all of you, and I hope to continue my joyful and interesting life with my family now. Thank you, take care, and I wish you all the best. Okay, uh, let's get some drinks, right? This is the. Thank you very much.